Morning. How's it going? You all good? <clears throat> My name's Kent. If I don't know you, I used to be an elder here. Um, I was told, once an elder, always an elder. Um, so maybe I just I had five years of service, and so uh, just went on that. I couldn't believe that Ryan asked me to preach. He's at a wedding, their family is. And so um, I was like, yes, because I didn't think I was going to get a chance to do that uh, for a while. So oh, then I served with Caleb and the students to get to do that from time to time in there and beat those kids down uh, with me talking, born in tears. Hey, that last song, just so you know, that was a special request by me. And even though it's a rare event for a Mac to fail or to restart, let's just admit that it's a rare thing. You people with PCs, I don't know what you're doing. Um, but what you experienced this morning happens about once a year, maybe, okay? Because it's a Mac. Uh, so I recommend it. See, I've got an iPad and I have an iPhone. I'm in the, the Apple family. I've bought into it. I drank the Kool-Aid and, uh, and I'll never go back. This is what it is, right? Anyway, that song, All Hell King Jesus. Um, hey, I, if you don't know that, I've worn it out in my truck. I've worn it out. It'll get to the point where I, I can't stand that song anymore, probably, although the words are just so powerful. Gosh. Um, I mean, if Jesus has changed your life, I don't know how. If you, it, you sing about when the light came on for you, when you came to know Christ, when it all made sense, man, for you. When Jesus made sense to you, when it all came together, man, your life was changed. And so to sing all hell, King Jesus, is a natural response for us as believers. Let's just be honest about it. If that's not a natural response for you, then I, maybe you don't know him. I don't know. I'm not trying to cause doubt in your heart. But when I hear that song and say, all hell, King Jesus, and I'm reminded, no matter what state I came in, walking into the building with, you just had a fight with your kids or your spouse, and they're wrong, and you're right, and you know it. <laughs> you walk in here, and no matter what your state of mind is, here's what the great thing about coming in here is, is you're immediately reminded through what we sing, because the songs, especially today, are off the chain. I love that saying, the next we're going to sing is good. And it reminds me of who I am in Jesus. It reminds me when the light came on for me. And it was when I was just a little, a little kid. Just a little kid. But now to see his work in my life, at six years old, all the way up to 13, and really when things really started to make sense for me, of who he is and how he works... And then to see his faithfulness through the years, in times when I didn't even think he was faithful, in times that I doubted him and his goodness, oh, so many times, I wish I could tell you I've made it. I have not made it. Doubting his goodness at times in my life, even in recent days, like, what in the heck are you doing? But then coming here this morning, you remind, he's always with me. He's faithful. And all hell, King Jesus. All hell, King Jesus. So I'm so glad you're here. I hope that you've already, just from the worship, even if you didn't know the words of that, were blessed by uh, what you heard. So we're in a study in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 14. So if you've got your Bible, I hope that you do. Um, y'all got your Bible? No, or are you just going to depend on the screens? Because you know the Mac will work, and uh, it'll be on the screen. On occasion, it will fail. Once every year or so. It'll be on the screen, but if you, if you have your Bible, then open it. Here's my encouragement to you, okay, this morning, and I'll run out of time because I'll start talking about this. It's not in my notes, but I just want to say, in the last month, God has done a work just in my own heart. Um, I get up and preach and teach from this word, and it will tell you, you should be in the word because it'll change your life. And yet, um, it's because I had a friend who said, man, I'm really only, I found that I'm only in the word when I'm teaching or preaching, preparing which is really a good thing to be in the Word to teach because I've been in Acts chapter, the end of 13 through 14, um, the last few days, several days, and man, it's been, it's been encouraging. Even yesterday in my own heart of being encouraged by what I read, the stories that are in here in the, in the Bible. Let me tell you something. Some people say that the, this book is hard to read, um, the Bible. You won't find that in Acts. It's a stinking movie. If you, I mean, we should make a movie on it of what goes on and what happens with Paul and, and Barnabas in this whole scene today. There should be a movie made because it easily could be done. 
it's a powerful story and it's not boring at all. So, um, but what God's done in my own heart is if I'm telling people that this word will transform your life and change your life, then, then I ought to be in it myself. And some of us, the only Bible reading we get is when we come here on Sunday morning. And here's not, not to put a guilt trip on anybody in here this morning. I'm not here to do that. Okay. If you get guilt, that's on you. I didn't put it on you. Okay. Here, here's what I want you to know. If you want God to speak to you, seriously, and I'm hearing this now as I'm speaking, I need it in my own soul. Kent, if you want God to speak to you, then you get in the word and you read it and you study it. And even yesterday, just in my own life, this passage spoke to me. <laughs> that in the midst of hard times, that come in your life when there are more questions than sometimes there are any answers in your life. That you persevere and that you endure despite that. Despite life beating you down sometimes. And sometimes life beating you down because of your own faith and walk with Christ. That you persevere to the end. And that God can do that through his word. Encourage you. Speak to you. You hear me? He speaks to you personally through his word, not just here on Sunday morning. Your primary growth will take place as you get into word. You hear me? Can I get an amen? amen. Y'all know what I'm saying? That's how he speaks to you. It's not through some, he can speak through a song or whatever. His primary way of speaking is through his word. And if you want your life to change and be transformed, you hear me, Jake? It's through his word, right? Right, Don? It's through his word. Always through his word. And so I'm encouraging you, just make a commitment to be in his word. So we're in Acts chapter the end of uh, 13, and uh, I want to read this. If you will, if you're able to, you can stand. We want to honor God's word. This is a symbol of honoring God's word. And uh, so we can read there. I'm going to stop at the, here in just a second while you're standing and make a point real quick, though. Verse 49, it says, and, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. Paul and Barnabas are on their missionary journey, and the word is spreading. But the Jews inside of the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city... They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and they drove them out of their district. Just get on out. Out of here. 51. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them. They went to Iconium. And verse 52. And the disciples, listen to this. Y'all read along here? And they were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Don't those two things go together? You're filled with the Spirit. Matt just prayed this. If you're filled with the Spirit of God and he lives within you, there is a joy that cannot be extinguished because of life circumstances. For whatever junk's going on in your life, because he lives within you and the Spirit has filled you. That's something I pray almost every day. God, fill me with your Spirit. And then when he does that, it doesn't matter the circumstances in my life. You got joy. You got peace. You got this. He's with me. He doesn't leave an abiding peace. And so Paul and Barnabas get kicked out. And what do we see? They're like, get on out of here. And they're like, oh, we're leaving. But we're leaving with joy because the spirit lives within us, right? All right, next chapter 14. Here we go. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue like they had done all these other times. And they spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed, but the unbelieving Jews, Oh, sorry, dogs, they stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers, poisoned their minds. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord. Imagine that, someone filled with the Spirit, who is speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands, but the people of the city were divided. I don't know how they were divided. You just saw a bunch of signs that God was doing, but they were divided. Some sided with the Jews, some with the apostles, and when an attempt was made by both the Jew, Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, wow, they learned of it and they fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Laconia, and to the surrounding country and there continued to preach the gospel. All right, we'll stop there. You guys can have a seat. We're going to continue on through the rest of 14. Um, <clears throat> it's a pretty powerful passage. If you stop and read it and think about all that happened in this particular um, passage of scripture is pretty amazing. So they, let me just tell you something here. Uh, I'm going to tell you a lot of things. But Paul came to know Christ. We believe on, in the master's road. Some debate on this. In around 34 or so, AD 34, okay? Two years later, Paul leaves persecuting Christians to then go and make much of Jesus. He said, I'm on a mission. I'm giving up everything and going and making much of Jesus. 
And if you remember from chapter 13, this is 13 to 14. This is his first missionary journey. He and his buddy are out. The church says, Holy Spirit says, send them out. They go out. I want to show you a map. Okay, this is the region uh, that we're talking. That's just a screenshot of I did of a Google map. First thing I thought was Israel. I don't know if you're watching the stuff that's going on there. Um, that's some of the most heartbreaking. Mm. You know what the reason for all this is? It's because the world is broken. It's fractured. And there's probably a lot more junk that's going to happen. If you read the Word of God, there's going to be a lot of junk that happens. But um, I hope you're praying for that whole situation. Unless God intervenes, my gosh, so many more lives are going to be taken. But this is the region where we're looking in the, in the first missionary journey. So you get just kind of a context. You see uh, Cyprus in the middle of the island. That's where part of 13, we, Paul and Barnabas went to. And then they go straight up to Antalya. That's where we're going to look. So next slide. This is where they start off. So they get sent out from Antioch on the east side to Seleucia. They sail across 130 miles to Salamis. You remember this story? They get on a boat. I can't imagine getting on a boat even now because within five minutes I'd be throwing up. Um, But they get on about 10 miles out. You can't see land. That seems, I'm out. Nope, I'm out. Sorry, God. You're going to have to fly me there. I'm out probably on the whole boat thing. But they go on a boat, sail for who knows how long. By the way, this whole journey takes about no less than a year, probably two years. Okay, the church sends him out and says, bye, go make much of Jesus wherever you're going. And they head out and they go across to Cyprus. I've heard it's a beautiful place. I have a friend who's done some mission work there. Beautiful people. I don't know if they're beautiful back then, but anyway, they go to Salamis and then they go around to the south to Paphos and it's there. If y'all remember from Ryan preaching, by the way, the last two messages Ryan preached in here, I've been here for a long time. Um, there's some good messages. I hope that you were here about the freedom that we have in Jesus. And you'll notice before I even get into this, Paul, if I could even go back, Paul caters the message of the gospel that he shares with people. He doesn't change the message, but he caters it to the audience in which he's talking to. So he's talking um, to people all along the way. Um, and again, this is a couple years time and we got most of it's just covered in a page or two in the Bible. But all along, I could make examples of this. He caters the message that he preaches to the people he's talking to. So he goes through the whole line of the Bible, the history of the Bible. These are educated people. And, and then ends up with it culminating with who Jesus is, right? So they go to Paphos, and um, they meet a sorcerer. One of them he calls, you are a son of the devil. I'd be like, I'm a son of the devil? How dare you call me a son of the devil? And he's immediately stricken with blindness for a time. And then there's a guy there... Um, I've already forgotten his name without looking at it. Somebody could tell me if you remember the scripture. Anyway, there's an official there, a really intelligent guy who comes. He sees this, believes. They take off and go north about 200 miles, north on a boat, a rickety old boat. Probably had some pails in there to bail out the water because it's leaking. Who knows? They go up to Perga and then to Antioch in chapter 13. Okay? This is um, another Antioch, Sidia. And that's where we find in 13, at the end of 13, when he says, we left with joy. So they go on down to Iconium at the end of 13. And let me show you what this road looked like. It's still around to this day. This is the Via Sabase. That's a road that you can even go look at. Uh, I've never been to this particular place, but would love to see some of those sites where Paul was. You read in the Bible and see what happens. That's a very, it's a, it typically is between 15, 20 feet wide, a paved road. And they go to Iconium. And that's where we land in this particular scripture, what I just read to you. So the main part, though, for sake of time, I'm going to get past the verse seven verses in this and get down to when they leave. They had a threat on their life. They hear about this threat and they leave and go to a city called Lystra. Lystra is, um, Stott calls it a, um, he calls it a backwater town. And it's just countrified, what Melissa used to be, like a country town. (laughs) Not so much anymore, is it? Not so much country. Um, but he would say about this town, they're almost half, they're half barbaric. Some commentators would say they're half barbaric people. They are uneducated. Very different than the folks up in Iconium. Iconium is a big city. In fact, today it's uh, the city of um, Konya, Turkey. Two, two and a half million people. So you go about, uh, I think it's 20 miles south to Lystra. And... Um, Anyway, these people are much different people. And he comes into town, he and Barnabas. And they immediately meet a guy that's there 
uh, at least I think immediately, goes straight into the story. I'm just going to tell you the story. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to tell you the story. They go in there and meet a guy who's been crippled. And Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit, heals him. So about these people in Lystra, they are people who are, um, again, very uneducated. And they, like in that region, very common, they had lots of Roman gods. And um, like we're, I'm about to go to India here in a few weeks. And the Hindu religion has like 33 million gods. I don't think the Roman, I don't think that whole thing has that many gods. But they serve all kinds of different gods. And even even at this moment, I'm reminded in Acts 17, Paul, you remember he goes into Athens and he sees a, an idol that made to the unknown God. They had so many gods. And he says the unknown God is Jesus. We'll get to that in a few weeks, I'm sure, in Acts 17. But in this one, um, these people are serving all these different gods and they're uneducated, barbaric type people. And Paul and Barnabas walk in. Can you imagine? Can you imagine as you go into to this place and their history and who that type of people they are with what they believe and they see a guy come in who they know this particular guy has been couldn't walk and they see Paul just go ahead and say the words he's you stand up the guy gets up and starts walking what they would be thinking they'd be thinking man the gods have come down if you don't know this about Lystra and I bet none of you do I didn't know it maybe you, maybe you're a scholar and you know this but the, the people of Lystra um, there was a legend that was written years and years ago. This is way back then, that the certain gods came down, and um, there was only one family in the village in that town that would take them in. And so the god blessed that family, but everybody else died. They gone, uh, just destroyed them. And so the people there had that history, and like they haven't seen these kind of anything like this ever. They just only heard about things. So imagine Paul coming in, going, "You just go ahead and get up." The guy gets up, starts walking. They immediately think, the gods have come down. Here they are before us. So they send people off to go get some bulls to sacrifice. And um, Paul and Barnabas, in that moment, they have a choice to make. Are we going to accept the praise of men here? And even though we just healed this and God healed them, but stroke that ego a little bit of how great I am, they all think I'm just (laughs) the gods. We, he had a choice, just like we do. We're going to make much of Jesus or make much of ourself. You can make an application just from that alone. But here's what happens. Paul, it says in the scripture that they label Paul as Hermes, which I think is actually funny. And I can just, in my personality, thinking about uh, if I'm there with Paul, if I'm Barnabas, boy, I'm giving him a hard time about this later. But they call him Hermes. Hermes is the god of, um, uh, of language. He was the inventor of language. So if I'm Barnabas, I'm like, they called you Hermes because you talk so much, Paul. You talk all the time. You are Hermes. And so later on down the road, I'd be calling him Hermes all the time just to mess with him. And you know what they call Barnabas? They call him Zeus. Zeus is the chief god. So I'd be holding him back. They call me chief. They call me chief, Paul. You just, you just talk a lot. But they call him that. They had a choice. Am I going to receive this praise? Or am I going to tell them the truth? And just as you, you can see from the, the passage of Scripture, um, they tell them the truth. They probably just got new robes up in Iconium. They've been to the store. They went to some nice, you know, mall and got them a new robe. And they were so emphatic about their response to those, about them saying that, this is, that they're one of the gods that have come down. They, as you probably know, in anguish, they tore their robes. They tore their garments to say, No, do not believe it. And they had a hard time shaking them away, saying, no, we're not gods. We came to tell you about the living God. And as I said earlier, he tailors his message to his audience. He knows these are uneducated people. They don't know squat. So he begins talking to them about what they see and how God has provided rain and for the harvest for them. And so he points them to the gospel. So the crowd's probably swayed a little bit. You have these Jews, these dogs from up here in Antioch and Iconium. They know about Paul. They know about his message of grace for whatever reason. Even then, even now, the message of grace can be offensive. Even in your own internal spirit of who you are. Doesn't it seem like we need to earn favor with God? Well, I got to do this. I need to go to church. I got to, I got I got to give in order to be right before God. That was what the message was last week. That before God, if you know Christ, if you know him, he's received, you've received that gift of salvation from him. You know him personally. If you know him, then you know this. You don't have to do anything to earn his favor. 
that your sin this past week or whatever's in your past, if you're a follower of Christ, Christ's righteousness, his holiness has been placed on you. So your sin from the past that you can't even, don't want anybody to know about it or what's going on currently in your life, the sin that you struggle with or the sin that you will happen tomorrow or next year or whatever, it's covered because Jesus lives within you. His righteousness has been placed on you like a warm blanket on a cold day. Boom, righteous because of him. That message can be offensive. Now, let me just add this little footnote here. Because of that, Paul says, you don't just go trampling all over grace. Because of his grace in your life, the response to the grace in your life, y'all hear me? Some of y'all look like you're asleep. The response to the grace of God in your life is not, well, I can just do whatever heck I want to do. No, it's when I see what he done, when the light came on, all oh, hell, King Jesus, the response is natural. Ooh, I want to be like you, Jesus. I want to be like you. But back then, this message that Paul was preaching, it was foreign. Like, what? No longer have to work for this, much of fallen, much of laws? No. It's by the grace of God. You've been freed, freed to now live. You know this when you come to faith in Christ, you come and die. You hear me? You come and die so that you can then live. So you can live. You live in freedom, making much of Jesus in your life. So these Jews come down and they stir up this crowd in Lystra. So much so that they drag Paul out of the city. I don't know where Barnabas is. That dude took a, a break. I don't know. I said earlier he went to go get a corn dog. I don't know where that came from. I'm going to stick with it. Let me go get him a good corn dog. Comes back. He's like, where did Paul go? They're dragging him out. And he can see them. They are stoning him. Can you imagine being stoned? Stoned in, uh, as in rocks, what I'm talking about. Okay? <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Earlier said, you need to clarify that. So some of you can imagine. Thank God that his grace is so good, he covers you when you've been stoned, okay? But Paul is dragged out. Come on now. Um, he's dragged out of the city, and they're hitting him with rocks. So much so. You ever been hit with a rock? It hurts, right? You ever play dodgeball? Imagine playing dodgeball with rocks, you know? That's what they're doing, Paul. And they injure him so bad that they thought he was actually dead. Now, I want to remind you something here. This is about two years after he came to faith. And I didn't say this earlier, not that you guys would even know it, but I just remember this. In Acts 7, he's there at the stoning of Stephen, and he's there approving of it. Don't you know that thought probably is going through his mind in that moment? I was there just a little while ago, not so long ago, there approving Stephen getting stoned. And here I am, getting stoned by rocks being just pummeled. So much so that he, they think he's dead. I mean, he's not moving, right? He looks dead. And they, they leave. And then the disciples, it says the disciples join and come around him and he gets up. I don't know if that was a miracle of God or if he was just, wasn't dead. I don't know. But it says that he got up. And it says, at the, towards the end of that, let me see if I can find it, if I can find it in my notes. Um, I can't find it. I'm not going to mess with it. I don't have time. It says, that, though, that he got up and he went back into the city. He goes back to the place where the people are that stoned him. Like, what? He might have, I would be thinking, you are been smoking something if we're going back in there. I am not doing that. But he goes back into Lystra. Are you kidding me? He goes back there in Barnabas. They leave the next day, though, and they go in down to Derby, which is about 20 miles down the road. That's a really cool name for a city. I like that. Derby, they go down there, for, and it says that they share the gospel more again and again. Let me tell you something. He had a choice in that moment. Just as another footnote, he had a choice in that moment. Is this really worth following Jesus? That I just almost died for him. Is it really worth it? And here, here's what I just, as I was thinking about this yesterday afternoon, um, and in my own life, that when he, the lights came on for me and to know of following Jesus, it would cost me. That if I knew all the things that it would cost me, that I had to give up everything to him, would I still have given my life to him? Paul had that choice there. This is stupid. I nearly died. I think I'm good. I'm going back. We go on Barnabas, let's go. He could have said, I'm going back. But he didn't. 
He kept preaching the gospel. You think about Paul. The guy was a Pharisee. He was highly educated. You know from all of his writings and just looking at his life, the guy had influence. He was probably, he'd be an amazing salesman. He'd probably win people over. He could start his own business, making some cool tents. It'd be real trendy. Get Paul's tents or whatever, you know. He could have made a ton of money, made a living, and still been a believer in Christ and still been in heaven. But he said, I am convinced. I am convinced that Jesus is who he said he was. And he said, I'm going to give my life for making much of Jesus. So that's what we see is that forget all the other things of this world. He says to the people in Lystra, he says, you guys have been looking after worthless things, worthless idols, and they're nothing at all. But I want to tell you about the one who is not worthless. It's Jesus. And so he gave his life. And that's the encouragement even for us this morning is an application for this is, have you been convinced of Jesus? In your life, hey, are you convinced that he is who he says he is? I heard a yes. Yeah. Are you convinced? Does your life demonstrate that you're convinced? Or people from the outside watching you and go, you don't look any different than anybody else in the world. Are you really convinced? Are you really convinced that Jesus is who he says he is? Your life's going to demonstrate that if you really believe that. I'm not saying that sometimes we turn to worthless idols. Sometimes I turn to my own worthless idols. And I got to remind it. Every Sunday I come in here, I'm reminded, oh, he did that for me. My identity is in him. It's not me earning my way to God. I've already been made right before him because of Jesus. And so I'll walk in that grace. But I'm reminded, get rid of those worthless idols. Turn your eyes to Jesus, right? Be convinced of who he is. Let your life shine for him because of you being convinced of this. So just to move on, verse 22 says this. Or let me read verse 21, 21, 20. When they had preached the gospel of the city and they had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra. They go back to Lystra again, it's crazy. And then to Iconium and to Antioch, they strengthened the souls of the disciples. And he says this, they encouraged them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. If you go on through the scripture at the very end, let me read this. They go all the way back to Antioch. Can you imagine? They've been gone a couple of years and the word gets out, hey, they're back. People in the church are like, they're back? Are you serious? They're running to the church and they start testifying, telling them all that happened. No doubt they told them all the stories, all the things that had gone on. I bet the Hermes, the God of language that Paul's a big talker, came up and he's like, yeah, that was Zeus. And so, I mean, they're telling all about this. And it says at the end, when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he'd opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. It says, and they remained no little time there with them. So that's the passage in, in Acts 14. That's the story of the first missionary journey of Paul. So he makes this whole, Paul and Barnabas make that whole round trip. So if Paul was on the road to Damascus, came to faith in Jesus around 34 or so, and he made this trip around 36, 37, AD 36, 37, somewhere in that time frame. Um, let me give you just a, a little bit of a timeline here. The journey was probably 46 or 47 AD, so it's about, I don't know, what would that be, 10 years or so from when he came to faith in Christ. 10 years, he sits out on the journey. He writes 2 Corinthians in 57, so another 10 years, okay? His first persecution happened on this journey, first real persecution. And then 2 Corinthians 11, nearly almost 20 years later, something like that, 10 years later, he writes 2 Corinthians. If you read that, that's his journal of all he's been through. I don't have time to read it, but it just talks about all the suffering he went through. He'd been shipwrecked. He'd been beaten. He'd gone hungry. He had been through all this stuff. And yet, he continues on. He gets down to 2 Timothy. That is the last book that he writes that we know of in the Bible. The last book. And he says this at the very end of Timothy. In chapter 3, verse 10, it says, You, talking to his, almost his son, it says, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, with my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at where? In Antioch, in Iconium, and at Lystra. He's pointing back to all those years ago, 20 years in the past of the time that he first got stoned there and almost died. He's pointing back to Timothy at near the end of his life. He goes on, which persecutions I endured yet from them all, the Lord rescued me. God rescued me. You know this, Timothy. <clears throat> yet from all, he rescued me. Indeed, all who desire, I want you to hear this, 
all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. He says it to Timothy. He's a believer and follower of Jesus. Jesus said it. You will have trouble in this world. You will have trouble. If you walk and live with Jesus and walk in a real relationship with him, just count on it. If you know Jesus and live for him in a way that's bold, which if you're filled with the Spirit, how do you not live bold for him? You live bold for him. You will have trouble in this world. And Paul says it to Timothy. You will be persecuted if you live and desire a life like that. 13, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving, being deceived. But as for you, Timothy, but as for you, church, all of us in here in 2023, but as for you, continuing what you've learned. This is the story of me. The story of Timothy is the story of me. We had two baby dedications this morning. Those children are going to be raised up in the church. They'll be able to say the same thing. He says, Timothy, continue what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from you, from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. That's a lot of your story is in here, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So at the end of his life, of all the struggles and all the pain and all the suffering that Paul went through, he could have at any point said, thrown in the towel and said, I'm done. I'm leaving. This is a bunch of bull. I'm still going to heaven. I'm going to go on. I don't want to suffer. But because he was convinced, he was convinced that Jesus was who he says he was. He was convinced that Jesus would change their life, that he would give them purpose, that he would give them meaning in life, that you would have a reason for living. He knew all the worthless idols, they end up in a dead end. And he says, it's still worth the suffering. It's still worth whatever persecution that comes my way. It is still worth it. And he says at the end of his life, knowing he's soon to be, be dead, he says, Timothy, you're going to be persecuted. But let me tell you, son, in the end, it is worth it to be in the end. So let me ask you again. Are you convinced? It's a rhetorical question. Just think about this. Are you convinced that Jesus is who he says he is? When the light came on for you, was it just a decision to get out of hell? Or was it a decision to say, I give my life to you, Jesus. I give my life to you because you paid it all. You make me right before God. I don't have to earn my salvation anymore. I can walk with you and trust in you that despite my sin, despite the, the, light, the fact that my life is a mess sometimes, despite my poor decisions, despite my disobedience, despite my rebellion, God, you never leave. And I'm convinced that you're always with me. So another thing for us, we're not, we serve kids. I'm getting, I'm almost sweating now. I'm just so into this. So good, isn't it? The gospel's so good. Gosh. We work with kids overseas. And a lot of the kids that we serve overseas, they get abandoned by their family. And so one of the points I always make to the kids, whenever I get to speak to them, and like in a message or something like that, I say, here's one of the greatest things about Jesus. He says, and the last thing he said before in the Great Commission, he says, I'll never leave you. I'll always be with you. And when I was six years old, he came into my life and he said, I'll never leave you. And through all the things in my life, he's never left. He's never left. He'll never leave you no matter what you're going through. My son, my oldest son just went to college and um, we're looking for help financially for that. <laughs> Amen. But when he was a toddler, we used to do this thing. I encourage you to do your kids. We, we would do a, we'd do a devotion pray with them, and then maybe this was dumb, but as I still look back, it's great. We'd lay in bed with them, have pillow talk, and then sometimes they'd fall asleep or I'd fall asleep. Tammy would. One night, it was, um, it was storming, lots of loud thunder. And I'm laying in bed after we read, and um, my oldest son, Brooks, he's laying there. He keeps reaching over for me. And I finally said, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, um, I'm sorry. I just feel safe when you're here. I just feel safe when you're here. Isn't that a picture of Jesus with us? That no matter what you're going through, he says he'll never leave. Despite your poor decisions, despite your life being a mess potentially, despite the uncertainty that's going on in your life, he says, he says this to you. Look at me, every one of you, if you know him, he says, I'll never, ever leave you and I'll walk through everything with you. And even in the midst of your questions and your doubts, he says, it's all right, I'm not leaving. You're my son, you're my daughter. So are you convinced? I hope you're convinced. If you don't know Jesus, this morning I'm gonna be down in the front in a few minutes. 
love to talk with you and can share you and point you to Jesus. Some of the other people will be down here, other ladies as well, point you to Jesus. But for the rest of us who know Christ, oh my goodness, ask him. Say, God, fill me with your spirit. Give me joy. Convince me again and again and again, God. You are, you say you are. Let my life reflect that the world will know. I'm convinced that it's worth following you at all costs. All right? Let's all stand. We're going to sing. Let me pray. God, thank you for our time today. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for stories and acts that are not just stories, but they're stories that encourage us so much to endure, to persevere. Thank you for your movement here. God, I pray you'd speak to us even as we leave today. We love you. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.